Look around. Some 20% of the folks in this room are going to experience at least one major depressive episode at some point in their lifetime. And although we can put people on the moon, we can fly through the sunny skies all the way to the moon, we're not very good at helping people with depression here on Earth see those sunny blue skies. So today, I want to talk with you about a different type of way of treating depression. It's not drugs. It's not an app. It's not a new AI bot. In fact, it's something we've been doing for thousands of years. Donna Summers was onto something, looking for some hot stuff to lift herself out of the blues, but I'm going to argue that she might not have been looking in the right place for that <laughs> hot stuff. So in the US, we're prescribing more and more antidepressants to hopefully lift people out of the blues, and it's easier and easier to get them. There's generic versions, primary care doctors can prescribe them, and yet, as we prescribe more antidepressants, there's more depression. What you can see in these brown bars is people taking one or two antidepressant medications. And what the green bar overlay, or what the green line overlay shows is the rate at which people are taking their own lives. Unfortunately, antidepressants work pretty well for about 30% of the people who take them. That means that 70% of people need more or different treatment. And I remember at the VA when I was doing rounds on the inpatient psych unit, talking to one of the patients in that 70%. And he said, you know, doc, I, I really don't want to talk today. I just want to feel good. I wish we had a hot tub. <laughs> and I said, oh, I, I wish we had one for you too. So I've got some old news for you. People have been using heat for physical, spiritual, and mental well-being and health for thousands of years. Being in the hot tub or the sauna, it feels good at first for a while, right? It's pretty pleasant. But if you stay in there for a long time, you start to get a little too hot. Your heart starts to race. And most importantly, you start sweating. And I want you to keep this level of heat experience in mind, the kind where you're forming sweat droplets, not just a gentle glisten or glow. Because our time today is short, and I'm going to narrowly focus on one broad area of heat practices, and that is sauna, as a potential treatment for depression. But first, I have some more old news for you. Decades old data have linked body temperature and depression. And some of these data have shown that people with depression have higher core body temperatures and lower circadian temperature amplitudes. And a few really intriguing studies have shown then have shown that when people with depression get effective treatment, whether it's effective psychotherapy, effective electroshock therapy, or effective antidepressant medications, their body temperature decreases and their circadian temperature amplitude increases. So I want to pose to you that it's entirely possible that for at least some people with depression, temperature, the temperature of their body might be a key part of the story. And I think we can actually see some of the clues to this story in ways that we're already treating depression. So two ways that we treat depression now, of the many, are exercise and antidepressants. When you exercise, you get hot, your body heats up, your heart rate goes up, and you start sweating. It's a thermoregulatory workout and a cardiovascular workout. And we know that running does work for depression. The problem is people don't like to do it. And we know that people are way more adherent to taking an antidepressant medication than they are to going running. Even data from last year show this. But when it comes to these antidepressants, does anybody here know what the most common side effect is of antidepressants? I kind of gave it away here, didn't I? It's sweating. Some 20% or more of people prescribed antidepressants complain about increased sweating. And yet, there's no data published answering the question, do people who sweat more when they take antidepressants also feel less depressed? We don't know if that's who it's working for. But I'll leave you with this. Now, you can actually get an anti-sweating medication prescribed with your antidepressant. 
And researchers have found that, yes, prescribing these medications does stop the sweating. But in this paper on the slide, you know what the researchers didn't report on was how taking that anti-sweating medication impacted the patient's depression in the first place. I thought that was really interesting. And so taken together, we can think about exercise, antidepressant medications, sauna. They can all induce sweating. And that's a major way that our bodies thermoregulate. What if that's involved in how they work for the people for whom they work? And can we think about that when we're thinking about treating depression? I wish I had a picture on my boss's face from when I walked into his office one day and said, you know, I think I want to build a sauna laboratory in the hospital. <laughs> he didn't flinch, you know, the other day when I asked him about plumbing to build a cold plunge. I don't think I can surprise him anymore. But as much as I want to tell you all about how I got so interested in this research, this clock here is ticking. I'll say this. I really like the hot summer. I like getting into hot cars, sitting on those hot seats. And it's no accident that I ended up in Tucson, Arizona for graduate school. That's where I met Chuck Grazon, my longtime mentor and collaborator. And in 2016, he published one of his dream studies. OK. In this dream study, he randomized 33 depressed patients to get one active heat treatment or one sham heat treatment to see if they could move the needle on depression. And the treatment took place in this device here. This is a German medical hyperthermia device. Okay. In the active heat treatment session, he heated people up to a core body temperature of 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit. That's kind of a mild fever, right? It's not comfortable. It's very intense. In the sham condition, they put people in the same device, but they just gently warmed them up. And it worked, because 72% of the people in the sham condition thought they got the real deal. So this is what we would call kind of a credible placebo, right? And these sessions were not short. They were an hour and a half or so. You were in there. It was intense. And the person's head sticks out of the machine the whole time. And what you don't see is that like a nurse-like person sits at their head and wipes their face with cold cloths and gives them water to drink and tries to keep them comfortable during this, because it's pretty intense. And what you can see here in this graph is that one session of heat treatment reduced depression. Um, the dark black, which should have a fuller line there, shows that the depression in decreased immediately after treatment, and it actually stayed down for six weeks. What you don't see on this slide is that in another study with 12 people in it, they gave them one active heat treatment and they measured their body temperature and their depression symptoms five days later. And the reduction in their depression symptoms correlated with the reduction in their body temperature. So that lines up with those intriguing studies that I was talking about earlier. So I was hooked, but I was taped up by the medical device red tape. I didn't have $50,000 to buy one of these, and I didn't want to wait for years for all of the various permissions I would need to get started doing research with it. So I spent a year searching for a different way to do this. And I found a commercially available device in the US with a fraction of the price tag. And it turns out there was a store over here in Berkeley that had one of these, so I called the store. And luckily, the owner of the store picked up. And I said, you know, I really want to do this thing. I don't have any money, but I really would like it if I could use your sauna, maybe your floor model, like let me borrow it. And he said, oh, no problem, I got you. Next day, he came to the hospital with a pickup truck and brought me a sauna. And I said, oh, OK, I guess, I guess we're doing this. Uh, he said, oh, good luck. Let me know how it goes. Um, so I took that luck. I needed it. And I developed a protocol using this new device. And I tested it in healthy people without depression. And what we saw, even in these healthy people without depression, was that they had less depression symptoms a week later. So that was enough pilot data for me to go and ask other funders to let me do this in people now with depression. So what we did was, instead of giving people one sauna treatment, we gave them four, one every other week, as part of an integrated intervention to see if we could get larger antidepressant effects. And 
What these dots show is that depression did decrease in the sample to the tune of about 16 Beck depression inventory points, which is a clinically meaningful and statistically significant effect. What you don't see on this slide is that of the 12 people who finished treatment, 11 of them no longer met criteria for depression by the end. So taken together, I think that the links between depression and temperature paint a pretty exciting picture. And before I close, I want to show you some data from a study I collected during COVID, where participants reported on their depression symptoms every month, and they reported on their body temperature every day, and they also wore an aura ring every day, which takes one temperature value per minute. And we're analyzing these data still, but I want to show you the simplest graph to come from these data yet. You don't need to understand statistics or fancy math to see what's going on in this graph. People with the highest depression levels had the highest body temperature. Before this analysis, the largest analysis published looking at body temperature and depression had some hundreds of people in it. This graph has more than 21,000 people in it. So now I want to make a bit of a provocative statement. I think that thermal dysregulation may affect a substantial number of people with depression. And I can't help but wonder if modern air conditioning and modern heating have allowed us to edit thermal stress out of our lives in a way that's actually hurting us. And I can't also help but wonder if reintegrating thermal stress in the example I've provided here, acute heat stress, could be an antidote for some people with depression where their depression is characterized by a thermal dysregulation. And it's true, thermal stress, it might not feel good while we experience it, but we often feel better afterward. This isn't rocket science. Think back to the last time you spent some time in a sauna or a hot tub or even a couple minutes in an ice bath. <laughs> After you get out, you feel pretty good. So I'm convinced there's something here, but there's a lot of unanswered questions, and I'm going to leave you with just a handful of them. I'm wondering if we can identify people who would be most likely to benefit from this treatment. Are they the people who are walking around with depression and higher core body temperatures? And how hot do we actually need to get people in these treatments? We've been using 101.3 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a mild fever. But that's a threshold. Do we need to get people to that threshold? Or do we need people to just increase a certain amount? Not everybody in this room is hanging out at 98.6. So 101.3 can mean different things for everyone. And how long do we need to keep people at these higher temperatures? We don't know. How often do we need to give people these treatments? I'm not under the illusion that one treatment will solve depression forever. What if we could monitor people's body temperature using something like this ring to figure out when we should have people come back for another hyperthermia session? And do we have to do it all in the hospital? Can we do some of these hyperthermia sessions in the hospital and then give people thermal homework, having them use heat blankets or portable saunas at home? And it's a likable treatment, right? And it doesn't necessarily involve disclosure. And that might be of interest to a lot of people who aren't ready to talk about their depression. For example, military service members, right? There's a culture of non-disclosure. There can be ramifications from disclosure. So what if we could develop body-based ways of assessing when people might need treatments, and then body-based treatments themselves? So as you can tell, I'm excited about the potential of heat treatment for depression, and hopefully you've warmed up to it, too. Thank you.